Kirsty. We've got a fantastic panel with you today. I'm Kirsty McNeil. I'm the Scottish Labour and Scottish Cooperative Party PPC for Midlothian. I will obviously take the opportunity to say it's a fantastic place to visit. Please start planning your summer holidays now. Uh, feel free to do dialogue. You'll get a fantastically warm welcome, I assure you, uh, from folks in Midlothian. On today's panel, we are trying to answer the question, is it possible to have an asylum policy that is simultaneously distinctively progressive and led by our values, capable of being implemented and seen to be implemented, and capable of securing sustained public consent. So three quite high bars that our panelists are going to try and meet today, but I have every confidence that they will. You'll be hearing in the first instance from Stephen Kinnock, who's the Shadow Immigration Minister and MP for Aberavon. You'll hear from Sundar Katwala, who's the director of British Future and author of How to Be a Patriot, but his most important job today is as Sonny's dad. So Sonny is with us. He is 13 years old. He's come to learn about politics. Sonny, give us a wave. Right, so if you've got any advice to Sonny about uh, progressive politics, feel free to approach him after the panel. We'll hear from Sarah Mully, who's a migration policy specialist and author of a forthcoming Fabian pamphlet on migration. Mike Tapp, who's the PPC for Labour Dover. Let's just remind ourselves of that. Uh, for Labour Dover, uh, who served in the Army, yeah, yeah, the National yeah. Crime Agency, and the MOD. And we were due to hear from Adaranki um, Apata, who's a barrister and founder of the African Rainbow family, who's joining us online. She was unable to travel uh, due to the tube strike. So a really fantastic panel for you today. Without further ado, I'll hand over to Stephen to kick us off. Well, thank you very much indeed, Kirsty. Um, and you've given me four minutes to uh, answer <laughs> some very uh, uh, complex questions, actually. But I'll give it uh, my best shot and really try and stay uh, within time. Uh, the first thing I wanted to say is I think it's really great that we're having this panel. Because I think if we're honest, as a party, we haven't always been that comfortable in terms of talking about immigration. But the reality is that it is a really important issue out there. I think a recent poll last couple of days uh, from YouGov showed that it's about number three in terms of issues of salience across uh, the electorate with economy and health being first and second. So it's a really, really important issue and um, I'd like to pay tribute to Progressive Britain for putting it on the agenda today. Um, the, my brief is immigration which covers both asylum and work-based migration. We're going to focus today on um, the asylum question, which I think is the right thing to do because the reality is that it is uh, the issue that is front and centre on the front pages of many of our newspapers uh, and in Parliament on a, on a very regular basis. So uh, I think it's right that we focus on that. But a very brief word on the work-based migration side. Um, we, we are committed to uh, keeping the points-based system. Uh, but we want a points-based system that will work far more effectively than it currently does. Uh, as things stand, there's no real connection between the points-based system and the real economy. No connection to productivity planning, no connection to workforce planning, no connection to, to skills and training to maximise opportunities for homegrown talent. So we need to have a new relationship with uh, uh, business and trade unions and government working together to ensure that we have sector-by-sector -sector, uh, workforce plans that demonstrate what is the immigration that we need so that businesses have the immigration uh, that they need to keep their businesses going, uh, but that has to be balanced against their commitment to ensure that their opportunities for homegrown talent are maximised. We've actually launched a review into this, going in, uh, talking to uh, key stakeholders across different industries and the Migration Advisory Committee and trade unions as well. So watch this space uh, on the work-based side. But uh, diving in now to the asylum uh, side of the job. Um, I think the key thing to recognise here is that the Conservatives are trying to frame us as a party that believes in open borders. Uh, and they uh, want to try and peddle the myth that uh, we are quite happy for the small boat crossings to continue. That is clearly and patently not the case. Uh, which member of the Labour Party would be in favour of allowing criminal gangs to trade in human misery and have people risk their lives by crossing the channel in these uh, dangerous boats. Uh, nobody in this room and nobody in the Labour movement. And so it's completely in line with our values to say we are opposed to the small boat crossings. Uh, and in that we agree with the government. 
Where we profoundly disagree with the government is in the methods that they are trying to put forward uh, to make that happen, because it's only going to make things worse. We're already dealing with a backlog in the system of 166,000 people who've been waiting for more than six months for their asylum claims to be processed. Those people are being left in limbo. We need a system that works so that people can be assessed quickly. If they're not genuine asylum seekers, they should be removed to the safe country from which they came because that is right for the integrity and workability of our system and for everybody to buy into our system, it has to work. And for those who are genuine asylum seekers, they need to be processed quickly, given leave to remain, so that they can get on with their lives, get a job, work, get out of the hotels, which are currently costing uh, the taxpayer £6 million a day. So the system as it currently stands isn't working for anyone. And of course, the, the government's bill, which we're calling the Bigger Backlog Bill, will actually only make things uh, worse. And that's why it's been condemned um, by the likes of the Archbishop of Canterbury, the former head of the armed forces, even Sir Geoffrey Cox, the former Attorney General, all fully paid up members of the tofu-eating Wokarati, uh, as you will know. Um, th this, this bill is saying that people won't be able to apply for asylum if they come on a small boat. They will be detained and removed. But there's nowhere to detain them, and there's nowhere to remove them to. The government talks about its Rwanda policy and sending people to Rwanda, but the reality is that Rishi Sunak has sent more home secretaries to Rwanda than he has asylum seekers. So the, the, it's, it's a complete and utter shambles. And on top of this, of course, they botched the Brexit negotiations. So when we left the transition period, we also left the Dublin Convention. And by leaving the Dublin Convention, you lost all access to uh, returns agreements, family reunion agreements, which enable that give and take quid pro quo relationship with the European Union, which is an absolutely vital element of a workable asylum policy. So uh, the first part of our plan is to show that we are absolutely and clearly opposed to the small boat crossings because of the reasons I've given. The second is to expose the incompetence and ineptitude of the Conservative government. Uh, and I think we're, we're doing that, but they're doing a pretty good job of doing that to themselves. Uh, and thirdly, it is about setting out our own plan. So in the uh, very short period of time that I have left, I wanted to give you a few words on our five-point plan uh, to uh, tackle this issue. First of all, scrap the unworkable, unethical and unaffordable Rwanda policy and redirect the funding from that into boosting up uh, the National Crime Agency and Border Force. Uh, and to get much more effective uh, work in terms of cracking down on the people smugglers upstream. So not just dealing with this issue once it's on the beaches of Calais, but actually going after the people smugglers uh, much further upstream. And I know Mike and others can talk about this with a, with a great deal of, of uh, knowledge as well. Second, we have to agree a returns deal with the European Union, which would be a successor to the Dublin Convention. We live in the real world. We know that you can't negotiate anything with the European Union or anything in life more generally, in fact, unless you put something on the table. That is about safe and legal routes. So we have to be going with a, a bold offer to the European Union saying it, we will have safe and legal routes for people to come to the UK, but in return you have to accept that when people come illegally on a small boat, they will be sent back to mainland Europe, where, by the way, if they want to the, come to the UK, they can apply. Because the only way to break the model of the people smugglers is to make it absolutely clear that anyone who's prepared to pay 5,000 euro to somebody to come on one of these uh, boats across the channel, it, the moment, if they know that the moment they arrive in the UK, they'll be sent back to main, mainland Europe, they will not come. That's the only, because the people that we're talking about here have got a very high degree of risk that they're prepared to tolerate. So we have to have a deterrent that actually works. Thirdly, it's about the backlog. Um, we have to upgrade the seniority of the case workers and decision makers. In 2013, they were downgraded. Massive exodus from those teams in the Home Office, and that has led to a 46% attrition rate in that department of the Home Office last year. No wonder they're not processing the cases anymore. No wonder the quality of the processing has gone down, so they're much more vulnerable to uh, legal challenges, and that clogs the system up even more. Fourthly, the resettlement routes, particularly Afghanistan, is not working at all. We've got to get that fixed and, and working properly. And finally, addressing some of these issues at the root cause of it, which is about getting our FCDO overseas development working much more effectively in terms of conf conflict resolution, 
conflict prevention, identifying areas of work where we can really work with countries which are originators of, of large numbers of, of asylum seekers. So in conclusion, I'd say that um, we have to deal with the uh, fact that the Conservatives are doing this mainly as an exercise in misdirection. It's about saying, you know, uh, the, there's cost of living crisis over here, hollowed out public services over here, international reputation being trashed over here, but don't look at that, look over here where there is um, some scapegoating that we can do around um, asylum seekers. We know that, we, we don't play that game, we constantly expose their incompetence and ineptitude because we know that a lot of people who voted for the Conservatives in 2019 did so based on the promise that there would be secure borders and controlled migration and, and they're not getting any of those things. Uh, we know the Tories can't stand on their record. They're blaming everybody else, blaming the judges, blaming the European Union, blaming the courts, blaming uh, the civil service, even blaming uh, Gary Lineker for all of their troubles. So um, we're not going to play that game either. We've got to ensure that people know where the buck stops. We've got to hold them accountable for that. And we've got to set up our own plan, workable, pragmatic, based on common sense and hard graft and quiet diplomacy to actually tackle this issue and to fix the asylum system that the Tories have broken. Thank you very much. Thank you, Stephen Sinder, over to you. Th thanks very much, uh, Kirsty, and thanks to um, uh, everyone involved in the Progressive Britain Conference for the chance to participate. British Futures are independent, non-partisan, think tank that's interested in how we have public confidence on issues of identity, where we build more common ground, especially on issues that are polarizing, like asylum and immigration. I think, um, you know, I agree with a lot of the analysis that Stephen has set out. It's worth, I think, understanding that this is an issue of anxiety and potential avoidance for people in the Labour Party and people on the left. I think that reflects some of the scars of the last decade. I think um, in the broader immigration debate, it's moved from being about asylum to being about free movement to being about immigration. But the, the loss of public confidence in how governments handled the scale, pace and experience of immigration is a, was a big part of the politics of 2014-2015, the Brexit referendum of 2016. I think one of the interesting things that happened then, which surprises people, is that, is that a lot of the heat went out of immigration except for asylum over the, over the five, five, six years after that, and it's worth reflecting on why that, why that was. People felt more of a sense of voice. People used to say, I'm not allowed to talk about this at all. It was very hard to say that after we'd had a Brexit referendum, left the European Union, you know, changed the point system, and so on. It also became much less one-size-fits-all. This wasn't just immigration, yes or no. It was, what do you think about NHS visas? What do you think about uh, uh, people coming to pick fruit? What do you think about different parts of the economy? What do you think about the situation in Ukraine? What do you think about the situation in Rwanda? So but, but, and in those different, we're going to see very uh, high levels of immigration, actually, but there is broad public consent for a number of the forms of immigration that have gone up. More people for the NHS, more students, more people staying to study and so on. So when you break it down, there's a lot of consent. So there's, there's more control, um, there's more selection, there's more sense of those contributions, and none of that applies to the asylum debate, where there is a visible sense of uh, a lack of control and a lack of compassion all at once. So I think you need to bring those, bring those points in, a sense of voice a sense of control um, and a sense of compassion into the asylum debate. It's clearly a difficult thing to do, but I think uh, an asylum system that's orderly, that's workable and that's humane has to be what, what you're aiming to, to, put, to put together. So it is very important to reiterate something that Stephen has said, which should be very clear that dangerous journeys across the channel where people risk their lives and are being exploited is nobody's idea of the asylum system we want to see. People might have extremely different views about, about how, to, how to change that. Very tough policies, much more uh, compassionate policies, but, but nobody wants what we've, what we've currently got. Um, and so how you, how you marry control and compassion in a way that's manageable, it is extremely chaotic, but we have to give a, a proposal that it is and should be manageable. If this becomes absolutely unmanageable, people will just turn off and blame somebody else for it. So we need to be much more pragmatic 
about it. I think um, anyone who follows this area for a long time knows that, in a way, the more headline-grabbing you know, promises of very dramatic things to put on the headlines, the less you're doing the really hard work of really the boring solutions that you negotiate on, that you fix systems on, and so on. I think you have to be clear about why you're doing that, but, but we need to try and take the heat out of it, not put the heat into it. What Labour will inherit once this new piece of legislation is passed, and the government is more or less passing the same piece of legislation, I think, a third time now, mm -hmm. say, so we'll pass a law that will stop the boats. Well, if that would work, last year's law would have stopped, would have stopped the boats. So it, it, isn't, it isn't going to work, and we could be spending you know, £140 million already gone to Rwanda. We could have cleared the backlog that then costs us millions of pounds uh, a week in hotels and had the people who need protection in our country getting on with their lives. And much more chance if you're from a safe country where we might be able to return you, like India or Bangladesh or Nigeria, you could have done that. So a really pragmatic sense that what people, what people should get if they're an asylum seeker is a fair hearing for their individual case and then, and then the right decisions that go with that. What the government is proposing is not at all well understood actually. Control versus compassion. If you get into that debate, a third of people do the toughest thing ever and a third of people hate all of that. But most people don't want to make that choice. Most people want the, the two things to come together. Um, it's not well understood and it's important to explain it to people that the government's plan doesn't try to pick out what people call genuine refugees, people with a valid claim. It just says, I don't care if you're from Afghanistan or Sudan or from Albania or from India. I don't care if it's a really strong case or a really weak case. I'm deporting you all. You're none of my business. And that really surprises people who are supporters in principle of a tough approach. You know, maybe we'd send people there when their case has failed. Maybe we'd send people there and bring back the people who had a valid claim. Those aren't a real understanding of what the government is proposing is the abolition of asylum in our country. And so the question becomes, how does, how does an island nation pay, play its fair role, take its fair share of the decisions that should be taken about people seeking asylum you know, in Europe and the world? We shouldn't do everything, but we shouldn't do nothing just because you've gone through France if you've come here. So Labour will have a backlog of people who claimed asylum. It will have a new situation, which is that there'll be people who've arrived since March 5,000 now, 30,000, 40,000, people who can't be sent anywhere else because they're from countries where the asylum acceptance rate is 90% or 98%, like Afghanistan, Iran, and Syria, where they won't be sent anywhere else and they'll be permanently banned from seeking asylum in Britain and the government will be putting them up forever. So it's an inherently unstable situation. Labour needs a very pragmatic account, I think, of how to repair and reform the system the law and the approach so that we can make fair and reasonable decisions about the lives that people have got, who needs protection in our country, who, whose claim didn't work and what, and what happens to them. One final thought is think there's now a, more of a consensus on who gets a visa to come and work and study in Britain. We should welcome that. That's quite good. Um, there's this very polarised debate about asylum where we need to take the heat out of it and start to be more pragmatic and realistic. There's a missing piece in Labour's thinking about agenda, because it puts, one part, it puts one part of immigration in the economy and another part of immigration in asylum and international obligations. It's also about community, contact, citizenship, integration, inclusion. We've seen an enormous growth of people who want to be involved in welcoming. People have hosted Ukrainians because that was the only group they were offered the chance to host. They got involved in being engaged with Hong Kong as people would like to help Afghans um, integrate into our society, given the chance to do so. I think Labour needs an agenda about work and the economy, about um, a humane and orderly asylum system, but it needs a focus on inclusion, contact, community integration as well, and I think that's currently missing. Thanks. Sarah, do you? Thank you. Um, I agree with a great deal of what's been said, so I will try not to repeat it. Um, I suppose, to start with, I would just like to say that I'm an optimist on those very difficult questions that we were posed as a panel. I think it is absolutely possible to have a migration policy and an asylum policy which is based on distinctively progressive values, which is deliverable, and which is politically and democratically sustainable. I think that's absolutely possible. I think I, where I would like to focus a little bit is actually on that, on the sort of values and principles part of that, because what we know about migration policy is that it is, it's, it, it is, there are all kinds of elements of the system which are not in anybody's control, right? So, you know, external events, international um, conflict, um, you know, things happen. And 
we've already heard, we know that the politics of this issue is also really difficult and can get very um, emotive. And in that context, if you don't have really clear values and principles underpinning what you do, policy gets kind of buffeted around and pushed around by these events and, and by the politics of it. And I think we've seen over many decades migration policy in the UK it becomes internally inconsistent very quickly when you lose sight of those those principles and those values. And we've already heard a lot about what those values might be. So we've talked a bit about fairness already, um, rights under the law. Um, you know, it's very difficult at the moment for the government to talk about a, a lawful migration system when they're also spending a lot of their time undermining the law upon which it is based. Um, democratic accountability is also really important. And I think it's worth thinking about why this is an area of policy which goes wrong so badly so often under, under different governments with all kinds of different political contexts. And there are some really deep-rooted systemic problems here. And I think accountability is a big part of this. So the, the mechanisms which you know, we rely on in other parts of um, government and public policy to hold systems accountable and to make sure that they are delivering what governments want them to and that they're delivering what the public want them to and that they're accountable to parliament and that they're accountable to communities. So much of that is lacking when it comes to migration policy. So we have very weak um, mechanisms of accountability to parliament, for example, just because of the way um, migration policy works. We have really weak accountability to local communities. Um, so I've worked in um, local and regional government for most of the last few years and you know, it's really difficult for local government and local communities to engage with governments on migration, there are, sort of, there are just very few mechanisms for that. And also, we've seen with the Windrush scandal that there are, you know, what happens when the people who are most directly affected by this system do not have a voice in it. And the government is now rejecting the recommendations, some of the recommendations coming out of that Windrush experience, which would have strengthened that voice and given people some way of engaging with the system. And I think unless we tackle some of those underlying structural problems, it, this is going to continue to be an area where different, you know, different governments with different politics and facing different issues will always struggle because we know that regardless of politics, unaccountable systems fail. You know, we need to all of us engage on this question. This is a whole of society issue. Um, and finally, I really strongly agree with um, Cinder's point at the end there about um, communities and citizenship. And I think it's, it's really important to think about how we are engaging people in the process of them becoming part of us. We, you know, immigration tends to be a conversation about insiders and outsiders, them and us. And I think as progressives, we need to be thinking about how we ease the journey where people can actually become part of us and become part of the nation and part of the communities. So there are hundreds of thousands of young people, for example, who are entitled to British citizenship, but who do not have it because of high fees, complicated processes, lack of documentation. They are locked out of higher education, they are locked out of employment. There are, there are simple things that could be done to just ease people's journey and make it better for them and better for the rest of us as well. Thank you. Thank you. So I'm going to try and add some value from, from my perspective. Um, obviously, what we've heard so far has been, been fantastic and really interesting. So I started off in the military, so I've actually been to these places that people are fleeing, and quite rightly, and I completely understand why. And that's why all of our immigration chat and, and, and um, uh, essentially what, what we put into policy must come from that place of compassion uh, and that understanding as to why people uh, flee these places. Then at the National Crime Agency, uh, I've seen how we've tried to battle this and, and some of the failures around that. Uh, I now work for a Labour Member of Parliament where I'm dealing with uh, a lot of the casework because of the backlogs uh, in the Home Office. So I've also seen that end. And I'm, of course, battling for uh, election in Dover, where this is one of the, the top issues on the doors. So I'm going to start off by, by talking about what I'm seeing in Dover, and it's actually really interesting. Uh, there's one particular ward, one particular estate um, out to the west of Dover, which is really at the forefront uh, of this concern, and, and that's where you've probably seen in the news that um, uh, someone came off one of the boats and went into a house and um, potentially threatened them, and, and it made the national news. And this, this really did get tensions uh, quite high in that estate. Um, so I've been knocking on these doors. Now, my first round on this estate, the door was shut very quickly on me, uh, open border labour. Uh, and that, unfortunately, is a hangover from not addressing this issue. So it's really important that we do. And I know Stephen's doing a great job of that, as is uh, Yvette and, and Keir. 
My second round, some of those doors uh, were staying open, and I listened to them. And, and it was often the top concern, and quite rightly in their minds. And there's nothing wrong with that. And we have to accept that as a party, that this is a very important issue to lots of people, so we have to deal with it. And then I explained to them, either that time or on the third round of that estate, um, our five-point plan. And normally, it's the first two points in there, which is uh, a national crime agency dedicated cell smashing uh, the smugglers and speeding up the processing so those that need help get it and those that shouldn't be here are returned. And that made them happy. And we've just won that award uh, in, the, in the elections in May. And you know, three years ago, that would have been possible. So it is really important that we do uh, address these problems with the voters. Now, there's always an argument around this, I think, as to whether we can win it or do we just try and neutralize it. From my perspective, I genuinely believe we can win this argument because the Conservatives, they want to speak about this constantly. It's one of their top five pledges, and all they're doing is highlighting to the voters their failures after 13 years, you know, with 160,000 now in, in, in the Home Office backlogs and, and small boat crossings uh, increasing. So actually, they're doing themselves damage, and with our effective five-point plan, I, I really do believe we can win this argument, and I'll continue fighting for that uh, in Dover. So on to, to my experience at the National Crime Agency. So the way it works is officers, intelligence officers, investigators will work across a number of different disciplines. So you know, it might be drugs one day, it might be CSE the next, and human trafficking another. So you never really get the chance to, to specialize uh, in an area. Some do, but most officers don't. If you have a dedicated cell that focuses on this, you can have a really deep understanding of this. And I've seen this at the Ministry of Defense working in counterterrorism, where you know it inside out. You know the way that uh, you know, the terrorists' w uh, minds work, and we can get there uh, with smugglers. But we do need a dedicated cell. And the way that can work, it, a couple of hundred officers, uh, intelligence collectors, investigators, analysts, and an enforcement team. Uh, and some of that would work upstream, so with our international and European partners where we're actually getting into the smuggling gang. So we'll infiltrate, uh, we can also influence uh, their, their operations, and it doesn't all have to be on enforcement. We can disrupt as well, and there's many tactics we can use to ensure that they don't even get to Calais with the boats uh, and, and start putting those people's lives uh, at risk. So that deep knowledge, I think, will be uh, vital. And at tactical level as well, we, you know, a lot of these smuggling gangs are operating in the UK, so we mustn't forget that. There's domestic smuggling going on here. So it's not all upstream, and we can work closely with Border Force and, and the policing uh, to ensure that we're getting on top of those, but it does need that uh, dedicated cell. And then thirdly, I'll talk about the, the casework that I'm currently dealing with because of these ridiculous backlogs that are just getting worse under the Conservative government. You know, I speak to some really desperate individuals who, who have been waiting in the system for two, three years, and they're not complex cases. It's just the fact that there's not enough staff dealing with them at the Home Office, and as, as Stephen said, you know, that's actually getting worse. But it's not just case workers we need. We need decision makers, so those who are actually going to make that decision so it can be delivered. And then the returns agreements are there, so we deport those that shouldn't be here and help those that should. And why not get people into work quicker, like many other in, in, in other European nations? We can ring fence that tech, uh, tax and put it back into the uh, immigration system rather than spending the, the, the levels that we are at the moment. So in summary, I really strongly believe we can win this argument. Uh, conservative failure has shown that, and, and we've got a really strong plan that we need to get through to the doors. But we don't have the opportunity to walk wards like I am and hit the doors three times to win that argument, so we do need to hit it in the media, uh, in my opinion. The National Crime Agency, Sarah, we have specialists dealing with things. They will get on top of it, as long as they're working closely with international partners. And we're going to need true diplomats to do that, instead of the likes of Natalie Elphick in Dover, who's constantly insulting uh, the French, unfortunately. And then, of course, we have to, to clear those Home Office backlogs so that we can uh, help those that need it and deport those that shouldn't be here. Thank you. And finally, Adirunka, over to you. Thank you. 
Good afternoon, everyone, and uh, thank you for inviting me to this conference. We've all heard from everybody, and I'm sure everybody knows what this bill is all about. It is just an outrageous expansion of the Nationality Border Act that was passed last year. There's no difference between the two, it's just expanding it and making it more toxic for people to come to the UK. I'm not gonna bore you about all of the difficulties of this bill, which you all know about, but we know that the right to seek asylum will be abolished in this country if this illegal migration bill was passed. And it is gonna ensure that the government would have unlimited power to detain people just as they fit. Not only that, it would also cause the fact that the human right of people will be trampled upon. And this makes me to think that if it is tested with people who are seeking asylum, this can then be tested with people who are not seeking asylum, who are British nationals. Because if we remember, or even look through the bill, section 19.1b of the Human Rights uh, Act, it is not compatible with it at all, because the government accepts that this bill would in fact be over 50% compatible. If that is the case, why should it go ahead? Because once this bill is passed into law, you can't be sure that it will be tested with other people's rights. And where are we going to be at that point? But my contribution to this conference is to, in addition to what has been laid down as Labour's plan, is to give you some suggestions that I think would help Labour government to have an immigration and asylum policy that will be fit for purpose, that will be compassionate, and also would respect the human rights of everyone, not just the people that are seeking asylum. We would like the uh, Rwanda policy to be abolished by Labour government. Some have told us today how much it costs for that scheme to go ahead. And how much is going to cost thereafter? Because in that scheme, there is no oversight. There's no accountability. Access to justice will be denied. No one knows how that would work. And the Britain that I think I know, prior to coming to this country some 18 years back, is the beacon of human rights. But I'm afraid with the tension that is going on with asylum and immigration right now in Britain, and if this bill is allowed to go through and become law, that beacon of human rights that I used to see the Britain, I don't think that would be the case anymore. Therefore, we want this Rwanda policy not to see the, day, uh, the light of day at all. We don't want it because of so many reasons that you are more aware of than I am. And there should be legal passage they're talking about wanting to break the smuggling cycle, which is okay. But how do you do that? We know that if there is illegal passage, one that is safe, people would not go to the smugglers. That's the best way to break it. People would not die. We would not be seeing children being swept, dead children, 
being swept to the shore of the sea every time, like we see now. What is going on in Sudan, for instance? I don't know if there's anything in place for Sudanese that are going through war to be able to flee safely to come to the UK. Therefore, this bill, if it is passed, will become one that is racialized. There will be a lot of racism embedded in that bill. Therefore, we want this legal and safe passage to be in front and in center of the Liberal Party when they become the government. The backlogs of application for people that are in here is killing. I'm sorry to use that word, but that is the experience of the people that we support as an organization. People are gone into depression. They've been waiting for two, three years even to be called for the second interview, which is the substantive one. So which means they don't even know what is going to happen to them. They, don't, they have no clue. They are in limbo. If somebody's life was stopped for six months, one year, two years, let us all think about it. What does that mean to that person? If we cannot think about this, then it means that we have this layer of some are more equal than the other. Anybody who is not allowed to work, who really wants to work or move on with their life and has been stopped for two, three years, these are times that we cannot take back. So I would want a more compassionate um, policy from the labor, the one that is more humane, if labor when Labour comes to power. Because all of these policies that we are talking about, they affect human beings. They are not affected papers or numbers. Even there's going to be reduction in the pressure of the NHS if you have a more compassionate system, because people would not live in limbo. Their mental health would not deteriorate, that they would have to depend on the, the NHS at the end of the day. And people would not even have to be claiming benefits because the time that they are active, when they, are, when they can contribute to the society, it's been taken away from them. But if they are given that chance to work and have their asylum system um, decided and then they have the right to work, that's the time that they can work and contribute. They will not become a burden at the end of the day to the benefit system. The angle that I'm coming from is that the angle where the UK continues to exercise and respect its own obligations to human rights. Also, we need to think about survivors of trafficking. With this bill, there's no protection for them. Someone who has been trafficked, who's gone through modern day slavery, only to be turned down and being told that you have no rights to even appeal anything. Everything goes back to being compassionate. Adironka, can I ask you to just draw to close so we've got time for questions? Yeah, sorry. <laughs> yeah so I'm going to just wrap it up and say all of these policies that we are talking about, what I want is a more compassionate argument policy for the Liberal Party. Fantastic note to end on. So I'm proposing that because we've got a big panel um, that we do a whole heap of contributions from the floor. So questions, reflections, challenges from the floor, and then I'll come back to panelists for a fine two minute summation, if that is all right with you all. Okay, contributions from the floor. Okay, colleague here colleague there and uh, get a colleague in a blue jumper here. You go first, Liam. <laughs> um, thank you to the panel. Uh, my name is Liam Martin Lane. I'm a Camden councillor. I'm really, really privileged to represent a really diverse community here in this borough and I definitely support the call for a more compassionate system here. 
but I also support a system that tries to deal with issues at source. And I think one of the reasons why a system really is not working is because we've got a government that is isolationist, that does not deal with the trigger and push factors that causes people to be refugees right now. There are not just conflict refugees, there are climate refugees, there are political refugees. So can I just encourage through potentially the idea of the restoration of a standalone Department of International Development to reassert our influence and our values abroad to be part of actually dealing with issues at source that stops people having to go down this really, really painful route of seeking asylum in the first place. Thank you. Um, so, uh, 50 years ago uh, last year, my father actually came here as a refugee from Uganda. Uh, and at the time, I think the debate probably was very much along the lines of some of the debates that we're having today. Um, but at the time, Edward Heath's government saw it as the moral duty of a civilized nation to help those people fleeing Idi Amin. Um, and we uh, took in and housed and settled 30,000 uh, refugees from Uganda uh, as part of that process. Um, it, it just seems shocking to me that the current government you know, couldn't be further away from that way of thinking and seem to be sort of largely pinning it on the ECHR, which in itself is a, a great post-war achievement. I guess my kind of interested questions would be, um, you know, how would Labour kind of fully staff and fund safe routes? I think, you know, uh, part, part of the way that we sort of break some of this is to actually give people the hope that they'll have a fair chance of coming to this country when they're in desperate need. Um, Mike, you kind of touched on it, uh, but I'd be interested in what Stephen thinks of some of your remarks about how we deploy some of the world-class security services that we do have in this country to actually tackle some of the criminals that are involved in this activity. Um, the, the last thing I would say, well, second from last thing would be, uh, I think part Please of this debate also thing. needs, oh, uh, sorry. It's just if everyone can keep yeah, to just about housing, I think that's a massive part of this debate, and it's not the fault of people coming here in need that we don't have enough space. And finally, I just think it's shocking that, for example, under the proposals from the government, uh, you know, a refugee who's made it all the way here from Afghanistan, a country that, you know, we owe a great debt to, uh, given the way that we withdrew from it uh, in, in recent years, kind of, you know, wouldn't have their case heard and would just be sent back. I think that's just really shameful. Thank you. Thank you. Colleague here. Hi, I want to ask uh, very quickly, um, uh, the safe and legal route, what the voters want to know is that that will reduce immigration. How would you reassure voters that having a safe and legal route will will reduce immigration, because that's what they're after. Great, and colleague at the very back. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. I think there were some very interesting um, things that were said. I just wanted to pick up on two points. The first is, I think one of the panelists mentioned the possibility of allowing people who are on the asylum waiting list to work. I mean, given we have so many vacancies in this country at the moment, particularly in low-skilled jobs, um, do, do the panel think, or does Stephen think that will be possible? And the other point I wanted to ask Stephen is, you know, a lot of this issue is it's, um, emanating from the French coastline. And uh, as we all know, efforts have been quite poor to work with the French to get this under control. I mean, do you think a Labour government would make any difference to that diplomacy and that diplomatic relationship? Thank you. Thank you. Colleague here with the long hair. And I'd say if we could keep them to under 30 seconds, we'll get more in. And then I'll come to Fiona here. Thank you. Um, I'm Anna Abel. I'm a Labour councillor in Haringey. Um, at the start, uh, Stephen presented Labour's five points um, on asylum policy. Um, I think there's a sixth point that I would have liked to hear more about today, and that's integration policy, both because it allows asylum seekers and refugees to find community here in the UK, but also it helps to build the public consent that Kirsty mentioned at the start. Um, so I'd like to hear what a Labour government's policy would be to ensure effective integration support to the UK. Um, in terms of Fiona McTaggart, uh, I used to be MP for Slough, and um, it's really good to hear some very practical things like improving the quality and experience and training of people who are making decisions, which will make a great difference. 
But can I suggest two things which have been tried before, which we might think about? One was that after the fire at Sangat, there was for about two days a home office uh, desk set up in the area where the kids were congregating, trying to get to Britain, which actually took decisions on a group of individual cases. If we could get an agreement to set up a post briefly in northern France, I think it would uh, bust the boats more, than, more effectively than any, anything else because uh, applicants would go there. And then the other thing which has been tried before, and it echoes something that someone else has said, is that under Labour, there used to be a policy which if it took six months to decide your case, you could then start to work. We could commit to that again, and it would be a way of ensuring that we would speed up individual decision-making, as well as getting some very skilled and talented people into our workforce that we need. Next, I think the last one. Uh, George Byrne. Um, first of all, just say I agree with a lot of what Sally and Sundar and Adaronke said, but my question is really for Stephen. Um, this is a global issue. It's not just about the UK and France. This is a crisis that's playing out in new ways across the world. I'd be interested to hear what you envisage would happen with a Labour government working with governments in other parts of the world, perhaps to reform the, the Refugee Convention, which dates back to the 1950s, perhaps to work in new ways, lessons learned, and, and so on. And by the way, Mike, very quickly, I was on the streets in Deal last week, and everybody seems very receptive to the Labour message, so <laughs> all good. OK, we've got time for one more, if it's a 30-second question. Yep, colleague at the back here. Hi everyone, my name is Chris. So I just want to touch on the point which uh, was mentioned by some of the panelists around the 1% claim processing. So I just want to understand what is causing the slowness of this process and what will Labour government do to make sure that we can speed up the processing as well. Okay. Thank you. Fantastic. So I'm going to come back to the panel now. You've got two minutes each and I will cut you off. Uh, Sarah. Um, a couple of quick thoughts on processing. Um, we've already, it's already been mentioned, but increasing the status, the seniority and the pay, bluntly, of those roles is really important. Um, it would really help if the government would stop passing legislation that makes decision-making more complicated and more difficult, because every time a new piece of legislation comes through, it makes all the decisions more complicated and harder to determine. And in terms of funding it, you know, you could start by stopping spending money on gimmicks like the Rwanda scheme and putting that money into, into processing. So I think, you know, there's some quite clear kind of good public service management stuff that could do quite a lot there. I just want to pick up the point about the, the Sangat experience. I think it, it's really worth looking back at that, both because there was processing in France, but also because people were offered the opportunity to come to the UK on a range of different routes. So what we do at the moment is we force everybody to come through the asylum route, which is the most complicated and difficult to determine. And actually, I think a lot of the people who are in northern France would qualify under family visa routes, work visa routes. We should be more open and pragmatic about the different ways that people could come, because it's very silly to have somebody who would qualify for a highly skilled worker visa and come and add to our economy being forced through an incredibly complicated, time-consuming and painful asylum process when we could allow them in through some of those other routes. And that was another thing that was really successful from that example. I shall pass on. Great. Stephen? Thank you very much. Some really great questions. Uh, I'm going to try and group uh, three things together, which is about integration and housing and work. And the, the fact is that all of those go back to the question of processing. Because as, if you've got people in limbo, you can't integrate them, they can't work, and you can't find them housing. They're stuck in hotels, they're stuck in inappropriate uh, initial accommodation, which is already uh, packed to the rafters. So I think it, it does all lead back to this, make the decisions quickly, and then allow people to work once they have uh, leave to remain. Uh, by the way, on work, our policy is that um, people should be allowed, allowed to work after six months. So if, if they've been waiting for their uh, claim and they haven't got it, and we, we need to go back 
to the actual service standard that there was, uh, which was um, every decision should be made uh, within six months, and that service standard was quietly dropped, and that's been a part of the process. So I, I'd say that I think the, the points on housing as well, there's something there around the need to ensure that we've got a fair distribution across the United Kingdom. Uh, we see some local authorities across the UK uh, taking far more than others. So there needs to be a... Um, a, a proper negotiation between the Home Office and local government, better coordination between Home Office and DLUC uh, to make that happen. Questions around uh, the relationship with France. Um, I think, well, it's absolutely clear that the Conservatives have spent the last few years destroying our relationship with our partners and allies, so there's no doubt at all that Keir Starmer as Prime Minister would be able to um, establish a far more grown-up and productive relationship. Key to that is getting a returns deal, key to getting a returns deal is safe and legal routes. Safe and legal routes need to be offered by the UK, uh, um, not just because it's the right thing to do in terms of reducing the number of people then that would come on small boats because it destroys the model of the people smugglers if people know that they can actually come on a safe and legal route. Right now that doesn't exist for somebody trying to flee Iran or Sudan or Eritrea. There is no safe or legal route. So that has to happen, but that has to be connected to getting a returns deal so that those who do come on, uh, a safe, on a small boat know that the moment they land in the UK, they'll be sent back to mainland Europe. We only get that deal with mainland Europe if we have a clear uh, uh, offer in terms of um, safe and legal routes. And the, the question about the uh, global issue is absolutely right. Um, that's why this ridiculous thing the Tories keep saying about, well, they've come from a safe country, which is France, they can all just stay in France. That's just absurd. The entire refugee system collapses if you just leave it all on uh, the shoulders of, of one particular country. So um, we have to have that um, recognition with the EU, but of course the, this, the returns deal has to be done with the EU, not with France. There's, uh, there's something called the... Um, uh, refugee and asylum management system, uh, a regulation on that which is being negotiated right now in the EU, which is the, the successor to the Dublin Convention, we have to make sure that we can plug into that. Um, we'll only be able to do that once we have a Labour government and that we can actually get our negotiations and relationship with the European Union uh, back on a much more stable footing. Thank you. Uh, right. Thank you. I'll, I'll touch on th three of those areas and see, see if I can add, add a little. Um, so in terms of defeating this at source, this is where I think we need to start leading as a nation. And, you know, I'm a true patriot and I mean that, uh, unlike a lot of the Conservatives who wrap themselves in flags and then destroy the country. And we can lead from the front. And a part of that is ensuring that we are bringing others up with us. Uh, and it is our commitment to bring uh, the, the spending up for international development up to 0.7%, I think it is, uh, yeah. after, after it's been um, sort of reduced by, by the Conservatives. That's really important, but that has to be a minimum. And this is where we can go back to looking at our, our green uh, agenda in, in the United Kingdom and creating uh, a green economy. And once we, we get that working, we can then export that to other nations and bring them up with us. And it is about leading from the front, and we are obviously going to see uh, the climate crisis adding to, to the migration issue uh, as the years go on. Uh, the second point I'll look at is uh, we talked about deploying security services um, around the world. We must, and we do have the, the, the finest uh, security services in the world, the finest police and the finest military, without any shadow of a doubt underfunded, but the training is fantastic. And unfortunately, our isolationist approach that we're seeing under the Conservatives has essentially kept, kept them at home. But this does, I'm not talking aggression here, I'm talking soft power and bringing people up with us. And we have to deploy uh, across the world to, to counter these cross-border complex uh, issues like, like migration. And then one more thing on, on slow processing. Uh, from what I see, it's about decision makers. We need more decision makers, and we have to be creative, and we have opportunities around artificial intelligence that we could perhaps uh, bring into this. Thank you. Thanks. Um, I, think, I think it's important to answer this question, but do you have an alternative? And I think we've heard, um, you know, Mike's experience on, in West Dover, that if you're confident that you can do that, 
that against a threat to detain and deport everybody because that will deter, which won't work in practice and is wrong in principle. If you can say we can be tough on trafficking gangs and protect refugees who need a safe haven, people are open to that conversation. British Future produced a report called Control and Compassion, which has a 10-point plan which examines the way, lots of the questions here about the way these things are all linked. You've got to move on all these fronts. So I'll, I'll post that on my Twitter handle, which is at Sunder Says, and I'm happy to hear more details from people. And I think, I think you can make a case that this is patriotic. My new book is called How to Be a Patriot. It has a white van on the front, and it has Everton Football Club, and it has Refugees Welcome, and Windrush 75 as its stickers. And those, you know, those are the commitments you, you, you can have about the chapter on immigration. It's called How Do People Become Us? If we invest in inclusion, integration, welcoming into our society for people who need to join it, that can be part of how we manage inclusion and integration. And final thought is the question about half a century ago and uh, the Ugandan Asians, and Lester said don't come, and now sell celebrates 50 years of contribution. I mean, we, we made a film um, with the Refugee Council for seven decades of refugee protection. We had a person from each of those decades saying, this was my experience, and I think that should continue into the future. That was contested in every decade of British politics. We did an experiment testing that film. Half the audience saw it, half the audience didn't see it. Support for protecting refugees fleeing war and persecution was 15 points higher if you saw that film. So those messages of this is, it's always been contested. These are, this is our better selves. And when we do this well, we should be proud of it and keep doing it. That is a very important way to hit that middle, unsure audience. So we could do more of that. But I'm very happy to hear from other people who've got more questions about this, uh, this session on email or on Twitter. Great. And final reflection from you, Adaranke. Yeah, I would just um, chip in here to say, in order to be able to reduce migration, and why people even flee in the first instance. The government should be looking at why are people fleeing? Why are people living in their countries? What is it that the Labour Party would do in order to be able to reduce, where possible, prevent people fleeing their countries in the first instance? Thank That's you. one thing that I think we should all think about. And when we're talking about funding the safe groups. I'm not an economist, but I'm sure that the money that has been spent or that is going to be spent on Rwanda, for instance, can be diverted into that. And lots of money that has been spent daily, which is about six million pounds daily in hotels, can be saved and diverted into integration where people can have more housing. The third distribution that was mentioned before would also depend on the availability of housing for people. So such money could be used to build more houses for people to be able to live in. And when people are well integrated into the community, we all feel safe and we will feel as part of the community. Speeding up the backlog, there is no doubt that a home office needs to employ more people and not just employing more people, giving them the wages that are fit for purpose, and also train them to be able to do this job well, because that's key. Even if we have one million people working there, if they have no clue about how to make good decisions, we'll always be going back to the courts, doing an appeal and all over it, all of the time, and time will be wasted. So they need to be thinking of how to eradicate the backlogs by having more staff and qualified ones, train them as at when deal, so that they can make better decisions. Fantastic, thank you. We started off this conversation with a reflection that we have to hit a bar that is simultaneously values-led, compassionate and progressive, that is implementable and that the politics of this can bear. Can I have a very quick show of hands? Do, who thinks we've hit it? Who thinks we've actually done the policy development and we we're, we're, we're have a policy prospectus that passes all three of those tests? Yeah? And who thinks a little bit more to go? Okay. Can you just keep your hand up if you are someone who either professionally or by your experience as a counsellor or uh, your lived experience as a migration system, uh, do we have lots of expertise in the room of people who'd like to make themselves available to Stephen to do that little bit of thinking? Can you just put your hand up so that Stephen knows... 
who you are. Yeah, I, I regularly come to CLPs to do have a chat, basically. I give a 15-minute spiel, and then I'm very happy to do Q&A with your CLPs. Fantastic. So um, we can make that happen either in person or on Zoom. Great, thank you. So I think some of you know that in my day job, I work in a humanitarian organisation, and we work a lot uh, with refugees. Uh, and a Ukrainian family that we had supported sent us a message last year to wish us a peaceful sky. And I think about that almost every day, about what you have to have been through for that to be your most fervent hope for other people that they experience a peaceful sky. Uh, we have got on this panel today a whole number of people who really remember that at the heart of the asylum system are people who are in desperate need of protection and really want to put our progressive values into action through how we design that asylum system. So can you thank them for their contribution to that very important cause, but also for the time that they've given up today. So thank you to the panel. Thank you.